Someone was just telling me that this has been such a mild flu season this year that uh, it's taken a lot of attention away from this. But uh, as I was just remarking, at the hospital we do some very sensitive testing for flu. And we're still seeing uh, not only cases, but an upt uptick in the numbers, even into May. That's very unusual, but it relates to the fact that this occurred very late this uh, season. So we're going to be uh, speaking about this, but what I'd like to do in terms of our objectives this evening is discuss some of the past flu pandemics. Some of the, you may historically know about what happened in 1918 with the Spanish flu outbreak, and there were other outbreaks in the 50s and 60s. And what information can we call from those in terms of lessons learned, in terms of what we have faced uh, in the modern daytime? We're also going to look at two uh, current uh, influenza strains and infections. One is the notorious uh, H5N1, and that is also called bird flu. And as we'll review, <clears throat> that has not developed significant capacity to transmit from human to human at this point in time. But given the high death rates seen in reported cases, that's a good thing. But understanding why that has or has not happened yet is an important part of the evolution of this virus. And the other one we're going to speak about, which is still with us, but the fanfare has died down, is the H1N1 pandemic flu. This was also called uh, swine flu initially, but it went through several uh, names in, uh, over the course of time. But ultimately, we found that this was a combination of bird as well as swine and human origin. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Along the way, I'm going to give you some clinical perspective on what these diseases can uh, amount to and uh, what suffering and death rates uh, we've seen. So with that as a prelude, let's talk about regular seasonal influenza. Around the world, there are up to 500,000 cases associated with death on an annual basis. That's a lot. In the United States each year, it's felt that we have 36,000 uh, deaths related to influenza. Now, this may mean that influenza is the initial trigger for someone having a heart attack that may go on to die or develop secondary pneumonia, et cetera. But when you group influenza and pneumonia together, that's the number that we generally carry around. Interestingly, and we'll, I think, be able to understand this as we go through H1N1, is the death rates or the numbers of deaths during that season in 2009 was much lower than this. Part of it is based upon which age groups were being infected. And we'll explain that most of the uh, disease was in younger age groups. And, and they survive more often. They don't have all these other coexisting medical problems. This also accounts for over 200,000 hospitalizations annually and economically about $37.5 billion from diagnosis and treatment of both influenza and, and pneumonia. And as I hope I can convince you tonight, uh, we have much to learn from prior pandemic influenza outbreaks in terms of planning and how we dealt with, for instance, the 2009 H1N1 outbreak. So the other thing is always in medicine, if we can prevent something, this is really the way to go. And if you look just at uh, influenza as one of the vaccine preventable diseases with cases and deaths shown here, uh, again, cases are probably in the millions in terms of the numbers of people infected. And we just said that around the world, uh, annually, there are up to a half a million deaths attributable to influenza. This is a vaccine preventable disease. And we're going to come back to the vaccine issue later because we still have some major challenges in terms of the manufacture of disease and getting this to the public. There still is reluctance by many groups to be vaccinated. Just talking to uh, one of our, our audience 
uh, in, in a, a short while ago. Some of it relates to a misunderstanding of the disease, its mutation, as well as fear of vaccine-associated side effects, among other things. So how are we doing? Uh, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, has set forth goals for certain vaccine-preventable diseases. And we're showing flu here, especially in individuals that are at or greater than the age of 65. And you can see we're far short. We're doing better, but we're still far short of our goal here. This also applies to the pneumonia vaccine against a bacteria called pneumococcus, uh, and uh, even flu uh, vaccine uptake in uh, younger adults, uh, I say that between the ages of 50 and 64. So we're clearly not where we should be, uh, given that this is a vaccine preventable disease. So I want you to look at this and focus on the excess pneumonia and influenza hospitalization rates uh, by the age uh, and risk sta status means that they might have an underlying disease for which they would have anticipated higher death rates from pneumonia if, if they did acquire it. And you can see that basically, uh, if you, especially if you focus on the, uh, these bars here, that it's, it's uh, really going to take its greatest toll in those that are older or very, very young children. Uh, whereas death and suffering is uh, ge generally better tolerated, uh, the illness is better tolerated in younger age groups. This will be in distinction later to what we see for H1N1. This is not what we saw. So H1N1 really defied all of our thinking or uh, brought that down a little bit in terms of the age distribution. Now here's the culprit here, and there's also a picture of this on the back of your program. But this is influenza A. There are several types of influenza, but the two major uh, pathogens or viruses that infect humans are influenza A and influenza B. Most of the problems related to um, what I'm going to discuss the rest of this uh, talk are related to influenza A, and that's why we're gonna focus on this here. So this is a virus, and remember uh, from previous years of, of school, viruses really can't make more of itself or replicate unless it enters one of our own cells. In this circumstance, Respiratory viruses, particularly influenza, enters our own, the lining cells of the, of the brach, bronchial tree in the lung. These are called epithelial cells. And when that happens, it can really utilize the genetic machinery of that cell to make more of itself and then be released and go on to infect other cells. So the majority in general of uh, the symptoms, clinical manifestations of influenza are gonna be focused in the respiratory tract, given what I just told you. But again, what we've learned from some recent uh, work is that this can really be more of a disseminated infection and disease than we used to think, and I'll come back to that later. So there are uh, ways that we name this virus, and there are two major uh, proteins uh, as part of the outside covering of this virus, one called neuraminidase and the other called hemagglutinin. So when we call something H1N1, for instance, H stands for hemagglutinin, N stands for neuraminidase, and, and they'll have different numbers associated with it based upon their biochemical structure. So the influenza A genetic code produces these two major surface glycoproteins. There are actually 16 of the H types and nine of the N types. Uh, all may be found in bird populations, but three predominate of the H types in humans, for the most part. Now the reason why, and still in this day and age, we need to recommend annual vaccination to individuals and we haven't gotten to the holy grail yet of being able to, influ uh, to vaccinate you once and that be a sustained response over time, is because this virus can mutate or change, either in a small way 
or in a major way. And if a major change occurs, and we'll go on to explain this in a, in a few minutes, then this can result in a large proportion of the population uh, being at risk for developing the disease and can bring about a pande pandemic uh, uh, situation. So this so-called antigenic drift are smaller changes and this actually happens all the time. When we talk about vaccination later, we have to take our best guess six to eight months before the vaccine is available as to what are circulating around the world in terms of the design of that seasonal vaccine. 16 of the last 20 years, we've been absolutely right. Four times we haven't been. Those are still pretty good odds. But we need to change this paradigm based in part on the mutation capability of this virus. And then the antigenic shift is where much more significant changes can occur and therefore more people would be at risk. And that was the case with the Spanish flu outbreak, uh, as well as some portions of the population globally with regard to H1N1. So pandemics do happen. I mentioned this at the beginning. The one that probably had the most devastating effects was the 1918 Spanish influenza uh, virus. And notice that many of these are named after the country where they thought they started. Uh, for, and with regard to the 2009 novel H1N1 strain, there were initial reports out of Mexico that you might remember but the Mexicans didn't want to have anything to do with the naming of this virus, so they thought it actually started in California, so there you go. <laughs> but there are the continued evolution of viruses, some of which are better equipped to infect humans, and uh, we're going to talk about this one as well as the H5N1 uh, as well. So this is a depiction from the New York Times Magazine related to the Spanish flu outbreak uh, and in 1918, 1919. 25 to 30 percent of the entire world's population fell ill. There were estimated to be over 40 million deaths worldwide. 60 percent were in younger age groups. And this is going to be akin to what we're going to see with H1N1. And in the United States, there were estimated to be over a half a million deaths. The problem here is our reporting systems in those days and our diagnostic means were not very good. We did not have the capability of supporting these patients or treating them for secondary pneumonias. So these are a bit inflated in that regard, but it's still very startling to see this. And in those days, and we were in our planning purposes for H1N1, if it got to this, we're planning to develop so-called areas of, uh, for just flu patients. And this is an example of this um, from the 1918 flu uh, epidemic. And actually, this was an avian flu. The way we know about this is that um, there have been some bodies found in the permafrost both in Siberia and in Alaska. And they were able to exhume these bodies and actually find that they died of, of influenza. And they were able then to do genetic analysis and find some of the factors that were very different in that virus compared to what we see now. The good news is there were some genetic changes in that virus that were not seen at all in H1N1. So that probably mitigated its aggressiveness uh, and ability to cause death. So pandemic influenza can happen. We just went through one in 2009, so uh, it has happened. And what this means when it uh, becomes pandemic is that there's rapid global spread from human to human. But other confounding factors include shortages and delays in vaccine and antiviral medication, the increased burden on hospitals, and how it can disrupt national and community infrastructure. We didn't get quite there with H1N1, but uh, we'll use this as an example. So if you look at several pandemic outbreaks, uh, these uh, occurred during these uh, periods of time. They were all influenza A, and the populations at greatest risk turned out to be, uh, especially for uh, the Spanish flu, the young and healthy adults. We're going to come back to that with H1N1 again. And a more common 
predicted pattern of infection among the very, very young and the older folks with regard to the two other Hong Kong and Asian flu epidemic. But just taking, uh, for planning assumptions, some of these statistics in mind, it's pretty staggering. And it assumes that about 50% or more will become ill and seek medical care, either in the outpatient area or need to be hospitalized. The numbers of hospitalizations and death will, will depend on the aggressiveness of the virus. I just mentioned the Spanish flu uh, outbreak, for instance. And you could look at uh, some of the 50s, and if it has a moderate occurrence, uh, then you'll see hospitalizations to this degree and deaths to this degree. And look how this is almost tenfold higher if you really look at uh, this being like the Spanish flu epidemic. My mother told me that she had the flu in 1918. Uh, she was living at home with her, she was unmarried with her unmarried sister. They were in school. And she said that no one else in the family caught it. She also told me at that time that any pregnant woman who caught it died. Is that true? So later on in the talk, I'm going to focus on the impact that influenza can have in the context of pregnancy. And we saw this very same thing occur in the uh, setting of the H1N1 outbreak. Uh, but fortunately, most of those women did not die. I think our medical care and our standards of care are so different and of higher sophisticated quality right now that that played into that uh, scenario. But pregnant women seemed, once acquired, they seemed to be at risk for more aggressive disease. That is true. And the dynamics of transmission, uh, although this was widely spread, it may well be that uh, the other household members were just lucky and stayed with, with, uh, away enough from your mother that was infected. And usually, when we talk about transmission of this virus, it's through what are called respiratory droplets, which are generated by coughing and especially sneezing. And if you looked at my first slide, uh, it showed uh, someone sneezing and the aerosolization of these so-called respiratory droplets. It's about a three-foot radius around that person where the concentration is the greatest. And the flu virus, over time, will die in the environment. So if they stayed far enough away from your mother, they may have been very lucky in that regard. I've heard that uh, some read some articles lately that uh, with H5N1 uh, that they're trying to make it transmissible from animal to human through genetic engineering. As some of you may have heard, scientists were beginning to identify the uh, uh, genetically the factors that promoted such uh, aggressiveness on the part of that virus in animals, and uh, they were trying to relate it to the human situation. And there was lots of controversy and discussion about whether or not the methods that these scientists employed in their research should be made available to, in the public domain. There was concern that groups could seize upon that and use it for bioterrorism purposes. That's been part of the issue. But no one in their research activity, although trying to understand how this works and using animal models for it, is not trying to promote its uh, becoming very adapted to uh, be associated with human-to-human -human transmission. The chart that you used uh, was dated 2008, uh, 2004. Uh, do you have any more uh, up-to-date information, especially when you say being within a certain number of feet away from the flu germ? I think of airplane travel, globalization, and wonder what kind of an impetus this place is on. The globalization of, uh, of everything these days can bring disease much more rapidly to other areas of the world. Another example of this is SARS. If some of you remember that, <clears throat> it probably was first uh, discovered in Hong Kong in a particular hotel. But then they could trace through very sophisticated methods how this spread to Europe, to Canada. Fortunately, we did not see this in the United States because by that time, I think we had recognized that. And there was all this paranoia about even allowing people to come into the states who had respiratory symptoms or even fever. And they were taking temperatures at the airports. 
But uh, your point is well taken. These can spread because of that. Uh, and I do think that one of the things that um, mitigated the whole issue with regard to the 1918 Spanish flu uh, epidemic is that travel is not as it is right now. There was some train travel, et cetera. But if we were, if that virus was here in this day and age, it would have been even potentially more devastating. There was a question about the bird flu. And its new name by some is highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI. We, like, we like to change these names all the time. This is highly aggressive in bird populations, markets and farms. And if any of you have traveled abroad, particularly in Asia, Africa, et cetera, and you go to the marketplace, there are chickens everywhere uh, in close proximity to the human uh, humans. Uh, in many cases, particularly in Asia, they have called uh, the poultry when they have discovered uh, H5N1 in, in that species. And uh, for a while, poultry imports were actually stopped from China because of this, if you remember this. This is back in the late 90s. And the first large uh, outbreak in humans that was uh, first uh, reported was from Hong Kong, and also in the late 90s. There were 18 confirmed cases, six deaths, and the risk factor for acquisition was really being around poultry. Uh, at that time, there was no evidence for either efficient or sustained human-to-human -human transmission. And it never has yet reached pandemic levels, and I'll define that in a few minutes. So if you look now out to 2012, most cases remain infrequent, sporadic, uh, and mainly still from bird to human. And the groups that are affected seem to be previously healthy, healthy children, young adults primarily. Uh, they often have had contact with poultry and there are also, however, now are some clustering of cases in households from Indonesia and Vietnam. And it looks like there may have been, although not proven, human to human transmission in, in those settings. But these still remain relatively few. And if it is, it seems to be self-limited because it did not break out from that household. And that's an important issue in terms of the magnitude of of uh, illness and death that's been associated with this. Here's a recent map since 2003. Uh, somebody asked me for updated data. And uh, this shows the areas of the world where uh, there are confirmed human cases. The three areas of the world where most cases are currently being seen are Indonesia, Vietnam, and Egypt, interestingly enough. So if you were planning to travel there, you should come and see us first, okay? Uh, in total, 600 cases have been reported. And of those, there have been 60% of these individuals have died. That, this has occurred in 15 countries to date. Now this likely, likely represents a significant underestimate of the true number of cases. And it's been recognized that there are cases now where these individuals will be either without symptoms or have relatively mild symptoms. Most of these cases have occurred in rural areas or in countries where they do not have the infrastructure to pursue the diagnosis appropriately. So even though I'm showing you a 60% death rate, and I don't want to underestimate that, on the other hand, this probably uh, overestimates the number of deaths that have really been seen worldwide. We have not seen any in the United States. We're not even shown on this map. So as we mentioned, and I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, it cur the current H5N1 currently lacks the ability to efficiently spread in humans. That is one of the factors that could make this pandemic, but it, it hasn't happened. So it's mainly in poultry. Humans seem to be a bystander here, and there might be some 
uh, changes, or excuse me, some cases of uh, H5N1 being spread from human to humans, but those seem to be self-limited and few in numbers right now. So the current H5N1 status per the World Health Organization is three, okay? These are the different phases. You would not reach a pandemic uh, level until you have widespread human infection. So we're still at the predominant animal transmission level in few human cases. Uh, but the issue is, could this mutate further in the future so that we would have to see sustained and, and rapid person-to-person -person transmission for this to occur? Could this happen? Let's go into some of the evolutionary and origin issues here. So with regard to H5N1, this really, for the most part, has an avian or, or bird reservoir. And this is the virus that's shown or depicted here. There can be direct bird to human infection. And if this occurs in a setting where you can get mixing of these viruses, their genetic materials, this could set up the possibility that you'll have human to human transmission. That does not seem to be a very efficient process right now, fortunately. Uh, but we'll look at another scenario that might indeed uh, raise the risk for this to happen. So that's this scenario where, again, you have an avian reservoir with a bird virus, or, um, and it gets into an intermediate host, another mammal. Swine are often picked upon. And many of these, as you've seen, have come from Asia, where there's often close, close uh, cohabitation of humans and their livestock, including uh, swine. So if this happens, you can get a combination virus. The fact that, it's, that it has occurred in a mammal, and if there's mixing of genetic material, and with the mammalian traits from the swine, it could make it much more possible that this would, if you get in the same mammal, a human virus, we know that H1N1 was in the pig population too. But if that all mixes, you could get a reassorted virus that uh, ultimately will affect uh, humans and you can get human to human transmission. This is probably more often the case as we understand it these days that you have this intermediate mammalian host uh, that will serve as the mixing uh, vehicle, so to speak. Let me give you a few clinical things about avian flu. So as I said, it can range from what we perceive in general to be typical influenza-like symptoms, fever, cough, sore throat, muscle aching. Most of you have had flu, so you understand what I'm talking about. But the potential at the outset or soon after the development of symptoms to go on to severe respiratory disease is there. The other thing that was curious, is curious with this virus, which we don't usually see with seasonal influenza, is other areas of the body involved, such as the eyes or the gastrointestinal tract. As physicians, we usually try to teach if somebody has diarrhea in the wintertime, it's not influenza. But as you'll see with this, and with H1N1, that's been uh, de debulked, the myth has been uh, debulked a bit. So here's an example of a case from, that was reported back in 2004 of an individual from Vietnam. If you haven't looked at chest x-rays before, all of this, which are, this is the heart here, this white silhouette, all of this should be black. And this person had pneumonia due to influenza and you can see the progression over a five-day period. This person died, and that's how rapidly this developed. So I just want to impress upon you that at one end of the spectrum, this is what we have seen and witnessed. But not all have this. So how do we diagnose this? We have to understand where it's happening around the world. Good question about travel and the global impact on diseases, not just influenza, but others. For clinicians, we have to suspect it, first of all. And that's often not done where access to medical care in rural areas of some of these countries is not very great. If you're going to try to collect uh, secretions from the respiratory tract in these people, you have to be very careful because of the potential transmission to you. And there are a number of sophisticated ways, one of which is a genetic test 
based upon finding small amounts of either the DNA or RNA of whatever infectious agent you're interested in, amplifying it up. It's called polymerase chain reaction. And this is a diagnostic test, by the way, that's being used more and more in the United States for a variety of infectious diseases. And I showed you this before, but remember the neuraminidase, I'm not showing the hemagglutinin uh, glycoprotein, but then there also is this so-called matrix protein. And certain of the drugs that we use commonly, many of you are familiar with Tamiflu, is that correct? Yes, raise your hand. Okay, that is this drug called oseltamivir. So it's a neuraminidase uh, inhibitor. And there are others that over time have become less effective because of the development of resistance by the viruses. We're always up against this, okay? So I'll have the chicken Tamiflu. Unfortunately, though in the laboratory, Tamiflu works quite well against H5N1. Here are the results in the few patients that have been treated through the mid-2000 uh, period. And the number of survivors are relatively small, but the numbers here are small too. So the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control have a new program in place to assist with appropriate diagnosis and early treatment. So whenever you talk about treating flu, if you wanna make a difference, you've gotta treat as soon as you can. That's the other message that I wanna leave you with. So, um, and we're working on vaccines. Some of that is embedded in that research that you were asking about. Uh, and there are many uh, attempts to develop an appropriate vaccine, again, using animal models, not only to understand what we call the pathogenesis, its aggressive nature and why it is so, but also to see if vaccines might work in, uh, as a prelude to using them in humans. I'm fascinated by these uh, families where there was apparently human-to-human -human transmission, but no transmission outside the family. Uh, has anybody investigated whether there might have been a genetic difference between that family and other people? And I guess part two of the question is, can the knowledge of a genetic difference like that uh, serve for a, either a treatment or an immunization scheme? When they have been able to study some of these household um, uh, cases or clusters, they have not really found that the virus has changed or mutated in that context. The human genetic determinants of susceptibility to influenza or beyond that to significant suffering and death have not been clearly established either. Uh, this seems to be self-limited probably in part because the amount of virus over time in those individuals who are homebound during the time they're sick uh, diminishes so that their risk to others uh, would be also decreased. But I think it's a fascinating question. From news reports, I think a lot of us have the impression when you speak of avian flu, you're speaking of poultry, uh, farm agricultural animals, and I just wondered how many species the avian flu affects. In the bird, uh, arena, it's uh, probably more than 50 that we know of. Most of the focus here has been on poultry, and that relates in part to the epidemiology, that is understanding the transmission to humans. It's mainly been with poultry exposure in those settings, but clearly there are other birds that can carry this as well. And many of them don't become ill, some do, uh, the chickens do, and that's why they called many of those uh, in the context of uh, the outbreaks in China. But it is beyond poultry, yes. Is the um, trans is what you're do trying to do, of course, is to prevent the spread. Yes. But is the way to do that just simply knowledge of how this is transmitted, or since it's a virus, is there any chance that a vaccine could be um, established? So both of those things are important: early recognition of disease providing effective antivirals. That's part of the WHO and CDC initiative right now. But all, and in that way, by treating this, one of the other byproducts is that you decrease the public health risk. So in part, 
your risk of transmitting a flu virus to me is based upon how much virus you have in your, your body. So with antivirals, we can rapidly uh, decrease those numbers and therefore your risk to transmit it to others will be also diminished. Another strategy that's taken for seasonal flu for individuals that may not be able to take the vaccine or didn't get the vaccine but are in a high risk scenario for developing complications is to give them preventative antiviral medication as well. But as I said before, and we're going to come back to this, vaccination for this vaccine preventable disease has to really be a major focus for us. At what point during the disease is it possible to spread it the virus to somebody else, maybe relevant to when the patient has fever, doesn't have fever, or other symptoms? You begin to shed virus um, even before you develop major symptoms, so that's part of the problem. But it's at its height, and that is the risk for transmission at the time that you're actively coughing and sneezing and in the midst of the uh, significant clinical syndrome that we associate with influenza as well. But there's some shedding of the virus, and there can be in certain pop subpopulations. For instance, bone marrow transplant patients, even though you treat them, a week later they may still be shedding virus. So it seems to be harder to eradicate the virus in certain populations. So you have to be even more careful, not only to them, but if they're in the hospital and other bone marrow transplant patients are around or a kidney transplant patient. So we have to be awfully careful. We'll come back to these issues about prevention and infection control later, okay? All right, so let's go to H1N1. Uh, this will wrap up the formal lecture uh, and then we'll move to dinner so we can get the rest of your questions in. So the first report of this was in the MM, should be WR, uh, this is published weekly by the Centers for Disease Control in April of 2009. And in that uh, circumstance, swine influenza A was detected in two children, you can see the close proximity, in Southern California. And there was a lot made of the fact that several of these uh, individuals and or their household members had traveled to Mexico first and there was this large outbreak in Mexico, I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, they didn't want to be labeled, though, Mexico, uh, as part of this uh, pandemic. There were no exposures to pigs, though, in these cases that we could ascertain. So somehow uh, it was transmitted. And by just four days later, there were 47 patients reported, uh, and the mean age was 16 years. Notice it's a relatively young group here. Uh, and uh, some of them had been to Mexico, but not all. If you look at the entire season of the H1N1 pandemic outbreak in the United States, if we define cases as those that had an influenza-like syndrome, cough, sneezing, sore throat, aching all over, the things that you would typically expect, and required hospitalizations, um, and if they were confirmed with laboratory testing. We saw over 41,000 cases, but only a 5% death rate, uh, only 2,000 deaths. Remember that the, the number of 36,000 that I told you about, usually on an annual basis. And in, at the beginning of 2010, this is where things stood. Uh, the blue represents 2009 H1N1, we are also concerned that other seasonal influenza types of uh, flu would also play a role. And they did in some areas, as you can see in the red bars here of the pie chart, but not significantly so. This outbreak, this season was dominated by H1N1. H1N1 is still around. It is still around and it is part of the vaccine over the last two years. Did anyone during the 2009 period get H1N1 vaccine, which was separate in those days? Did anybody get it? Remember all the difficulties and the challenges in signing up and getting the vaccine? It was a morass, and this is what the government wanted to do to try to control and at least count numbers. The bean counters wanted this. But it really, I think, significantly impacted on uptake of vaccine. 
Furthermore, by the end of November, remember this started back uh, in the cases uh, in California much earlier in the season. It was really out of sync with what we usually see with seasonal influenza. By the end of November, this had petered out. And <clears throat> many who were expecting major problems throughout the rest of the winter season, we did not see it. So with regard to this slide, we showed you that for H5N1, we're in this phase three period. We reached pandemic levels or the definition of pandemic influenza where there was widespread human infection, rapid human infection, efficient human infection, and almost all continents of the world. And the WHO declared this a pandemic. And we're now in the post-pandemic period, but we still have disease activity, but it's now associated just with seasonal influenza. So this is transmitted, whoa, similar to the regular influenza viruses we see seasonally. So it's person to person. I mentioned respiratory droplets, relatively close contact, and sometimes uh, contact with contaminated surfaces. The incubation period, meaning the time from when you're exposed to developing disease manifestations, ranges anywhere from one to seven days, can be pretty rapid, mostly one to four. And then we talked about the infectious period, uh, one day prior to symptoms, uh, but up to seven or longer for certain groups and children uh, included. The complications were similar to seasonal flu, but pneumonia was the most significant, as we usually see every year. But the groups that were affected here were very different. So they were the very young, occasionally the older folks, pregnant women, we're gonna come back to this, there was a good question about that, and those with chronic underlying disease, particularly related to the lungs, heart, liver, diabetes, mellitus, et cetera, or those that are immunosuppressed by way of disease or medication. Now, they're talking about animal models and what we learned from them with respect to influenza viruses. Here is a report from 2009 from Nature where they used a ferret model uh, of <coughs> influenza and they transmitted this uh, and used seasonal influenza and also infected these ferrets with H5N1. And in this setting, uh, the 2009 H1N1, first of all, was transmitted as readily as our regular seasonal influenza strains, but it produced greater numbers of virus uh, and was associated with more severe pneumonia. I'm gonna show you an example of that in a second. And at least in that model, its aggressiveness and the pathologic changes we saw microscopically in the lungs was very similar to that which we see with H5N1 avian influenza. So this had the potential uh, to really cause uh, significant problems, but it did not. If you look at the percentage distribution of deaths, this gets us back to Mexico now, and you're looking at, for instance, in the orange bars here, the usual pattern that we see, uh, excuse me, uh, the usual pattern in black and white from uh, regular seasonal influenza, again, it's the very young and it's the very old where deaths are seen. Notice the distinction for the 2009 H1N1 outbreak. It was really in younger age groups uh, and not so much in the older folks, fortunately. So why could that be the case? So I told Neil I was gonna talk a little bit about immunology, but uh, this is a study that was published looking at antibody responses in blood of individuals throughout the course of their ages. And you're going from those born in the 2000s to those born even a few uh, from the late 1800s, or from stored blood samples from that time. And in that regard, you can look at it, when we consider what is protective to be a level of at least 40, that is you can dilute their serum down 40 times and still find good uh, activity against the flu virus, that the majority of these folks uh, were older. 
and there and the antibody titers diminished excuse me uh, in those that were younger so this in part explains why the epidemic was so focused centered in the younger age groups because the older folks already had some protection now that protection may have occurred from exposure to other avian or swine flu viruses in the past <clears throat> pardon me and some even from the 1918 epidemic if they were young children and still alive during this time but uh, there was some cross protection uh, in the older individuals so we did not see a flu epidemic as usually expected at least among the age groups so the clinical features are those that you would typically see notice however that stomach ache and diarrhea were seen frequently with h1n1 <clears throat> again that goes against most of the dogma clinically that we have been preaching for years here's a case uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine from Mexico, <clears throat> excuse me, that, again, we looked at that chest X-ray on that Vietnamese patient before, and this is actually pretty severe pneumonia. Uh, this uh, was all due to influenza, and believe me, this is not what the lung should look like microscopically. There's lots of hemorrhage here and inflammatory cells. The air spaces are filled with lots of debris and fluid, uh, and that person did uh, die. So one of the interesting things about the mix between flu and super infection, secondary infection with bacteria, is that the flu virus particularly has a way to damage many of the immune responses we have uh, and also our ability to clear virus uh, and therefore uh, expose sites on these same epithelial cells that will attach avidly uh, for the bacteria that can cause pneumonia. So I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is a common problem that we face clinically. We may be dealing with influenza at the start, but then it can move on to bacterial pneumonia as well. And so the perfect storm is the fact that we have now seen cases in otherwise healthy individuals who have had MRSA, MRSA. Have you heard about that? Okay, it's in the community now. It's usually been associated with relatively mild skin and soft tissue infections, but it's beginning to have a profile where we see more invasive disease. And this is one of the settings where we do. The classic bacteria that follows on the heels of flu is this organism called Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So this is really the perfect storm. Talked about pregnancy. In general, it's been recognized through previous pandemics and seasonal influenza to this date that this has a more severe disease course and death rates too. During the 1918 pandemic, uh, a question came about. Uh, in the United States, uh, almost 1,400 pregnant uh, women were uh, reported, 27% died, it wasn't 100%. And there can also be effects on the pregnancy with uh, miscarriages, preterm labor, et cetera, and whether or not pregnant women are more susceptible uh, to influenza uh, because of the pregnancy state and the so-called uh, immune depression that occurs with pregnancy to accept the fetus is a point of interesting discussion. So it did occur at a higher frequency in terms of admission rates for pregnant women versus the general population. Uh, death rates were 6% in the women in the US compared to 0.5%. So there was some disproportionate uh, uh, contribution of pregnant women to those death rates of 5% that I saw you before. Fortunately, no infants of these pregnant women at birth were infected and um, they were often treated late in the course. And I've made this point before. If you're really going to treat, you have to treat early, okay? And it also, not to go into great detail, but this affected children, as we just reviewed in that Mexican slide. And many of them had the bacterial co-infection with uh, 
bacteria like we just discussed. So we can make the diagnosis, but at our institution at University of Hospitals, we've again relied upon this PCR or polymerase chain reaction. It's the most sensitive technique to do this. It's more costly, but we can identify patients, cohort them in the hospital, and really mitigate the tr horizontal transmission of influenza to some of our most disabled and sickest patients. And then we could treat, but the most important take home message here is treat early. And the public has to be educated about this as well in terms of getting to your physician who can treat you for this if you're gonna make any difference at all. And I just wanna uh, end by talking a little bit about vaccine, where we're at with that, and then infection control. But this virus has grown in chick embryos. Uh, and the first, uh, flu vaccine was actually available in 1943. But it takes a long time for this to, the manufacturing process to come about. So we need really much better ways of doing this. And the number of eggs that they have to use to get three, 300 million doses, which is the population of the United States, is staggering. And we did vaccinate. Many of you did receive it. There was initially, because of shortages of vaccine, because of the time frame, some priority given to those individuals at highest risk, including pregnant women, those at risk for dying, et cetera. And there was a good antibody response from the vaccine. Not gonna go through that. So when you have flu, we always preach good hand hygiene, okay? The alcohol rubs work, soap and water works. Gotta do it frequently. Know about cough and sneeze etiquette, etiquette, you know, covering your cough, your sneeze, et cetera. And there has been more education, I think, for the public about that. And obviously avoiding ill individuals, like the mother that was ill, uh, as we were told about. So this is what we should do for a person, I'm just teasing, but we do, in the hospital setting, we take this seriously, and we do isolate these patients away from others that could be at risk. Okay, so just a few summary uh, slides and then we'll end up. Uh, and from the WHO, one of the comments was, although it seems that H1N1 has receded, this is uh, at this point in time from the public consciousness, it is expected that it will, be con it will continue to be a significant virus and it has. And it circulates now uh, in seasonal times, including this year. Um, and it is still recommended that H1N1, even if you got it in 2009, be included in the current vaccine. The uptake of vaccine in the United States was only about 35%. Some people who were exposed or had illness uh, certainly developed protection, but not all. One reason that this pandemic struck a chord is uh, this uh, develop uh, possibly, and many of these others in developing areas of the world and spread throughout the world through the globalization as we talked about before. Others have said that it feels like the world is being overtaken by these infectious agents. And not only are we faced with influenza, but spread of other infectious diseases, uh, including SARS, which went away. Uh, some of these bad viruses in Africa, one called Ebola, which has a very high death rate associated with it. So we need to have a plan in place. That was done as I was talking to uh, one of your uh, audience members before the talk. Uh, there was a lot of money and effort put into this, particularly during the initial recognition of the H5N1 bird flu. And we had to be prepared. And it seemed like there was a lot of wheel spinning and preparation done for nothing. And then 2009 hit, and we are much better off because of that planning. And it really takes a major concerted and collaborative effort among multiple groups, whether they be public health systems, hospitals, outpatient areas, businesses, educational institutions like Case Western. There was a task force that looked at this, but also you. You need to be educated about this uh, as the public and contribute to the planning and the approach. So let me end there, and thank you very much. <laughs>